Today, I want to talk about precision. Not about precision when it comes to me announcing things, because we already know that doesn't happen. But I want to talk, talk about precision in some other ways. You see, I have this weird hobby where I like to take chunks of uh, copper and using the device, lob them downrange at about 2,800, 2,800 feet per second using what's called a rifle. I remember one time I purchased a rifle and on the top of it you have these little screw holes and they're machined precisely and on, on that rifle I, I put a, a Picatinny rail, it's this little piece of metal and when you put it on there you can't just screw it in however you want because it'll, it'll warp it and so there are, are specifications and you get a torque wrench and you set it for the exact pressure and then you put a type of glue on there to keep it from, from unscrewing and you, you get it on there and you get it all perfect and then you put on, the, on that Picatinny rail the bottom of your scope rings and you put those on there and then you, you put the scope on and you have to measure how close to your eye and then you want to level the gun, there's a special level and then you want to level the, um, the scope, it all has to be leveled and then you tighten it up according to the specifications, and then you get a laser inside so that you can bore side it and all this other stuff. All that to say that you have to be very precise because at 50 yards, a slight variation turns into a huge variation at, you know, a thousand, where obviously is where I'm shooting. But, <laughs> not really. I ran into this problem though because I took my rifle to a gunsmith and every time they put the, the scope on, uh, the, the scope wasn't lining up with the balance of the rifle and then I had another friend look at it who was in the military and currently on the SWAT team and what we figured out is that the scope rings that I was using were junk. They weren't machined very precisely and when, as we tightened it, it would slightly shift the scope. So we got rid of those, we got some real scope rings and we got it on there and I went through the whole process again using Loctite Blue and all the other torque wrenches and then I got it out into the field. And then I was in a, a, a four wheel drive Jeep way up in the mountains at 10,000 feet on roads that were so rough that your neck is sore the next day because you're holding onto the Jeep and this is happening all day, see even now it's still a little like, you know. So I'm in this vehicle for five hours throughout the course of the day. And I get out and I notice that my rifle, the base rings, are now loose on the Picatinny rail. Why? Because the specifications to tighten the top of the rings were different from the specifications on the bottom of the rings. And however precisely machined my equipment was, if the user isn't precise in the application of the, uh, uh, of the um, stats, then, then it all just goes to heck. So all that to say that I, I messed up the trip because I wasn't precise in my equipment and in my application of, of applying or, or installing this equipment. But that's okay, I used my friends and then brought home something to eat. But all that to say, that if you want to succeed, in some areas, you have to be precise. Other things, not so much. Hand grenades, horseshoes, nukes, you're fine. I bring this up because as we look at Genesis chapter 3, what we're going to find is that when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, when it comes to interacting with the Lord, when it comes to bringing our offerings to the Lord, when it comes to bringing our worship to the Lord, one of the things the Lord demands of us is this same word, precision. So if you would, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Our big idea today is worship well, that we ought to bring our offerings with faith and precision. Now, while you're turning to Genesis chapter 3, um, as of last session, we are officially done with the creation story. We've examined the concept of an uncaused cause. We looked at creation. We looked at evolution, science, the age of the earth, the literary perspective of Genesis. We looked at marriage, the work and the person of Satan. We looked at sin, forgiveness, and even the earliest prophecies about the Messiah, which appear in Genesis chapter 3. And so today we move into chapter 4, which begins the journey of God's people outside of the Garden of Eden. So here we are, Genesis chapter 3. Starting with verse 23, I'm reading from the ESV. This is what the scripture says. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. 
He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. And so Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Now, if you have your Bibles, tablets, or phones, and you want to follow along, we're going to be looking through this verse by verse. If we look at verse 23, we find out that Adam was driven from the garden, probably because he didn't want to go. And the first command that was given to Adam, it says that the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to do what? To work the ground. Now, he had been previously working the ground, but this soil was going to be different. The soil in the garden was the soil of paradise, but according to the punishment, the soil outside of the garden would produce thorns and thistles, and it would only be through backbreaking labor that Adam would be able to get the soil to bear fruit. We're also told that the Lord appointed a new guardian of Eden. Now, not a guardian of the galaxy. That's something different. This is a guardian of Eden. Now, remember that the last cherubim the Lord placed over this garden fell into hubris, fell into self-aggrandizement, and it was this seraph that tempted Adam and Eve. So the Lord stripped him of his rank and his position, and a new guardian was needed. So we read in verse 24 that the Lord placed a guardian cherubim and a flaming sword. And if you read it, it's not clear. Does the guardian cherub have the flaming sword, or is there a guardian cherub on the left, and then there's a flaming sword floating in the air on the right? I'm not really sure how this works. But regardless, they are now guarding this Garden of Eden. No one was allowed to go back to the Tree of Life, and so this place, this paradise, is forever lost from history. And if you could find it, which you can't, but if you could, the guardian and the sword would be blocking the entrance. And by the way, it seems that so many human endeavors are just an attempt to get back to the Garden of Eden or an environment like it. We long for a place like the Garden. Russell Brand, who I'm told became a Christian, recently tweeted this. He said, What is addiction other than an attempt to return to the Garden by sensory means. Interesting perspective from a new reader of the Bible. Now, if you are wondering, the tree of life is not lost forever. It appears again in the book of Revelation. And if we are in Christ, we will eat of that tree once again. So Adam and Eve were driven out. A new guardian was placed at the gates or the entrance to this place. The Garden of Eden is now gone. Now, I want you to notice something in chapter 4, verse 1 that there is a name change of God. You see, in chapter 1, God is referred to in the Hebrew as Elohim, and that's a generic name for God. It's just kind of, it could be any God. So in chapter 1, he's Elohim, but then in chapter 2, he's called Yahweh Elohim. But as we move into chapter 4, he's now simply called Yahweh, which we translate as uppercase Lord. So is there a reason for this change? Well, the liberal scholars proceeding from the Wellhausen Graf hypothesis, they'll argue that, well, this shows that what we have here is a collection of different sources and different authors over time, and this was patched together somewhere around 500 BC, and so what we have is just a patchwork of different myths and stories. But we would disagree with that, and we would say, no, that the author is using the different names of God for a literary purpose, because at the beginning, the generic name for God was this grand creator. But as the Lord then begins intervening and working in the midst of his people, then he's called by his personal name, that is Yahweh. Now, chapter 4 begins with a description of reproduction. It says, Now Adam knew his wife, or knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Now, remember, in Hebrew, 
They use a lot of euphemisms. They don't like to say things just outrightly, but I think we understand what's happening here. They're a married couple, they were intimate, and then she conceives. Now, some might ask, and this is a reasonable question, whether this was a part of God's original intention before the fall. In other words, did God plan for Adam and Eve to have relations, then conceive and have children? And this seems fairly clear to me because in chapter two, he tell, chapter one rather, he tells all of creation, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And he says the same thing to Adam and Eve, and this is before the fall. The issue is we don't really know how much time passed between the creation of Eve and this fall. And I would suspect it was very short because at the end of chapter two, after Adam meets his wife and he says, she is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In the very next verse, it says, now the serpent. And so I suspect that they were married for about 10 seconds. And it's then that the serpent showed up. So they didn't live as a married couple in the garden for very long. Uh, but regardless, the physical relationship between a married man and a woman was not and has never been a sinful thing. The Lord God created this with certainly boundaries, but within those boundaries, it's a good thing because in Genesis 1 and 2, he says it was good. Now, as you would expect of any healthy married couple, Eve gets pregnant, bears a child, and they call him, chapter 4, verse 1, Cain. His name is a play on words that you don't really see in English, but his name sounds similar to acquired or gotten. And her rationale was, I acquired a dude, so I'm going to call him acquired. Cain was the first human being born in a way that we would call natural, and probably the first human being born with a regular belly button. And that is a theological topic that you can discuss at the Oktoberfest potluck as to the theology of that. But notice that the curse was fully realized in this story. Adam, after leaving the garden, had to work the ground, and he was successfully working the ground because uh, Eve is not going to conceive if there's no food. And so he has to go through labor on the ground, and now Eve has to experience the pain of her own labor. So they both experience the curse, the fall, and the pain. But in verse 2, it tells us that Eve had another son named Abel. Whereas the narrator decides to give us the background of the name of Cain, there's really nothing mentioned about Abel's name. It must not have been significant. But the author or the narrator does note that Cain was a worker of the ground while Abel was a keeper of sheep. Now, notice between verse 1 and verse 2, we have about 18 years that just happened instantly because in the beginning of verse 1, she conceives, and by verse 2, the ch both children are now working the ground and, and, you know, animal husbandry and so on. Now, you might wonder, well, wow, this is pretty crazy. The, the, the third and fourth human beings on the planet, they know how to farm and they know stuff about animal husbandry. Well, we're going to look at the development of technology in two weeks, so stick with us. But there's something else of interest here. In verses 3 to 4, we read of what we can only describe as a proto-sacrificial system or an early sacrificial system. Because in verses 3 to 4, both Cain and Abel, they bring their offerings to the Lord. Well, how does this work? Because the sacrificial system under Moses is still 2,500 years away. We don't really know much, but we know that the Lord must have instructed them on how to give, how to worship, how to sacrifice, and how to relate to the Lord in a ritualistic way. And in fact, we're even going to read of someone tithing in the book of Genesis. And so by the second generation of humans, there was a religious and sacrificial system that was put in place that had standards and instructions. Well, what were those instructions? We have in the foggiest. What we do know is that Cain brought produce to the Lord as an offering, and somehow he did it wrong. And Abel brought the firstborn of the flock and portions of fat, and somehow he did it right. So is there any indication as to why one offering was accepted and one was not? Well, I think yes. You see, some have tried to argue that the reason the Lord received one offering over the other was because of the type. And some will joke that the Lord accepted the meat because he wanted us to eat a lot of meat. Could be. 
But it could be also something else. You see, if we look to the Old Testament later on, what we find is that there were animal offerings, there were bread offerings, there were fruit offerings, there, was, there were wine offerings. There were all different types of offerings. So I don't think it has to do with, with meat versus vegetables here. Notice something in verse 3. It says, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Now, notice there aren't many adjectives here, and the description is morally neutral. It just basically says, yeah, he brought an offering. But in verse 4, the narrator adds some other things. It says, Abel brought the firstborn of the flock. Cain brought an offering. Abel brought the first fruits of an offering. There was a right and wrong way to worship the Lord as there is today. Abel did it correctly while Cain somehow botched it up. And it probably has to do with Abel giving the first fruits while Cain gave whatever he wanted. And this is, of course, the danger that we run into today, that when we come before the Lord and we offer up whatever it is we are offering, so often what we want to do is give our leftovers. Well, I've got this little bit. I've got this. Here's this gap. I've got some extra, so I'll give it to the Lord. And what the Lord is saying here is, no, I want the first fruits. You give me your best first. And I think that's the issue here with this offering. Our big idea today is to worship well, that we must learn to relate to God, to worship God, and bring our offerings to God in a way that is pleasing not to us, but to Him. He gets to set the rules. Now, I admit that there is not an exact parallel between this story and us because we live under different covenants. We're no longer under a sacrificial system. Uh, the system under which Cain and Abel lived. But nonetheless, there are principles found here in Genesis chapter 4 that are going to translate to the New Testament and translate to us. As men and women under a new covenant, a covenant that was established by Jesus in that upper room, there are ritualistic, offertory, and worshipful things that we are commanded to do before the Lord. And so my first point today is that we must bring our offerings with precision. And there is that word again. Now, of course, there's not a thing in the Scripture called a precision offering. But what we do find is that the way we worship, the way we offer, the way we re uh, relate to the Lord is critical. And when I say critical, I mean life and death critical. We must do things exactly the way the Lord tells us. Now, if we go back, remember that the Israelites agreed in to enter into a covenantal relationship with God. Moses had all of them gathered there in the desert, and the book of the covenant was read to the nation. And in that book of the covenant, you have all these rules and regulations. And upon hearing it, the Israelites said, yes, we agree. Yes, we'll do it. Here's that event in Exodus 24. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. So the Lord says, here's the rule book. You don't have to agree, but if you want to enter this covenant, here it is. They said, we agree, we will do it. And the Lord also told them, everything I command you, you shall be careful to do. There's that concept again, that precision here are my commands, and you've got to be careful with these commands. You shall not add to it or take from it. And so the people agreed to live this way, and in the same way, you and I, as people uh, who are far removed from this Old Testament law, when we became Christians, when we called upon Jesus as Lord and placed our faith in Him, we agreed essentially to the same thing. Jesus Himself said that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So how does this relate to Cain and Abel? It has to do with the precision of worship, of offerings, and sacrifices. Friends, God takes the ceremonial aspect of our faith quite seriously. He rejected Cain's and he accepted Abel's. And we're going to find this all over the Bible, that the Lord cares about the meticulous application of His commands. Let me give you some examples that frankly, are not that easy to read. Here's the first one, Leviticus chapter 10. It says, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, 
each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So these two, these two kids, these two guys get together and they say, hey, we're going to do an offering too. We've seen dad do it. Let's do it. What happens? Fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Why? Because they did not follow the procedures of how the Lord wants his offering to be done. Here's another one, 1 Samuel 13. This has to do with King Saul. It says, he, Saul waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And later on, Samuel showed up and he said, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. You see, what happened is in the Old Testament time, there were prophets, there were priests, and there were kings, and they typically didn't overlap. So Saul was a king, but he was trying to function as a priest, and he wasn't allowed to do it. He was not authorized to offer these sacrifices at this time and in this way. So Samuel shows up. He says, you've done wrong. And it was at that moment that the Lord took the kingdom from Saul and then would later give it to David. Here's another one. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took a hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. You see, what happened is they, were, they had the Ark of the Covenant. You've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, maybe, right? You know, that whole thing. So they've got it on this, on this cart, and they're, they're, um, they're moving it across the country. But on the threshing floor, there's sometimes leftover grain and wheat, and one of the oxen stumbles. Now, who wouldn't do this? You know, you're, you're, you're next to this thing. Here's this holy thing of the Lord, and, and the cart starts to move, and so you put your hand on it to keep it from falling. You know, like when you're breaking, and then you, you try to, the person next to you, you put your hand here to keep, like, like that's really going to work, right? Uh, but we do it anyway. So it's just reaction, like, oh, I'll steady the cart. So his motives were good. This wasn't a bad person, and yet, look what it says. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the Ark of God. Why? Because only the priests were allowed to touch the Ark of the Covenant. Your, your motives didn't matter. It was this, this look, this is, this is a precise command, and it says that he was an error, and then he died. Now, these are Old Testament stories. Here's one from the New Testament. Paul is warning us about the way we take the Lord's Supper. He says, whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. And then he goes on to say that some people are taking this Lord's Supper in a way that is unworthy, and some people are getting sick, and some people are dying. So this is, this is some scary stuff. We step back and we think, wow, the Lord really does care about the precision, the mechanics, the meticulousness of how we worship Him and how we bring our offerings to Him. With that said, I have some concerns, uh, not about our church specifically, but just concerns about Christendom in general. And I don't want to come across as calling out people on their behavior, and maybe it will come across that way, and I will call myself out as well. But... The only question to ask today is, does the Bible teach us something about how we should do these things that maybe needs to change with us personally? When it comes to bringing our offerings and worshiping and taking the Lord's Supper, do we need to make any changes here? Because this is serious stuff. So let's look at the first one. This is, we talked about doing it in a way that is precise, but we need to talk about our offerings of remembrance. You see, Jesus commanded us in the Gospels to do a specific thing by which we would remember him. Uh, this is not a sacrifice. We don't do sacrifices anymore, but this is the recognition of a sacrifice. We are to do something specific that honors the Lord, that glorifies him, and it causes us to remember what Jesus did. We call it the Lord's Supper. We are directly, clearly, and unequivocally commanded to engage in this practice and to do it with a certain attitude. Here's Paul's full warning from 1 Corinthians 11. Whoever therefore eats the blood or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then 
And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you here are weak and ill, and some have died. This is, this is scary stuff. The Scripture tells us that, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I think there, there should be some healthy fear, um, like, like a father who loves us, but at the same time, you know, dad has rules, and if you break the rules, there's going to be consequences. Now, once again, the Lord rejected Cain's offering, but he accepted Abel's. And we have to be careful that if we do not take the Lord's Supper in a way that is precisely how he commands us, if we do it casually or flippantly or without examining ourselves, we may very well eat and drink judgment upon our own lives, according to the words of Paul. Now, if you're new here, we celebrate the Lord's Supper 14 times a year, which I know seems kind of odd, but that's once a month on the first Sunday of the month, and then we do it on Good Friday and Christmas Eve. So how should you and I, as, as, as believers in the Lord Jesus, take the Lord's Supper with precision and with a way that is consistent with His commands? Well, first I would say, be here. We're commanded to do this, so, so be here and, and be on time. And then Paul says, examine yourself. This is, this is a, a time of, of holy offering, of holy remembrance before the Lord. We're entering into this time and place, and I ought to examine myself. And then take the Lord's Supper and do it in remembrance of Him. But I think the temptation is like, oh, yeah, I'm here, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. Oh, gosh, I've got this appointment, and okay, here's the bread. And we just sort of do it. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You, this is serious stuff. You've got to examine yourself. Now, here's the next type of offering we do under the New Covenant. Oh, by the way, we'll have the Lord's Supper next Sunday so we can put that into practice. But here's the next thing is that we're to bring our offering of music before the Lord. Now, so we're on the same page about what the Bible teaches. Here's a breakdown of the, of the various musically related terms that we find in the Scripture. And what we find, these are the, the number of times these words appear Clearly, God is a musical God. He has a heart for music. He created music. And one of the primary ways we worship the Lord is through lifting our voices to Him as an act of praise. We are commanded to present our vocal and musical offerings before Him. But sometimes I observe some things, once again, not necessarily in this church, but just in Christendom, that concern me. And so sometimes I see people just not singing. I know there are exceptions. You have people, that maybe they have a sore throat. Um, maybe my, I had a friend who had throat cancer. Maybe someone has small kids and they're attending to the kids, which is a good thing. You should have your kids with you uh, because you're being an example and training them up. There are emergencies. You have someone who's in the hospital and you're on your phone because you might be getting this horrible, I, I get that. And I get that some people come in and maybe something's going on in their life and their emotions are so strong and they're hurting so much that they can't even bring themselves to open their mouths. I get that. I also get there are new people who don't really know any of this. I get all that. I'm talking about the average Christian who should know this stuff, who are not engaged, who are on their phones, who are having conversations in the back or showing up late and missing the portion of the service that involves the vocal offerings. Now, you might ask, wait a minute, Nathan. If you were worshiping, how did you notice other people not worshiping? <laughs> it's a good question. It's kind of like, you know, the, the, the kids praying at dinner, like, so-and-so had their eyes open. Well, how did you know? <laughs> but as we discussed with the Sabbath laws, there were certain exemptions. There were people who, who were not required to hold the Sabbath laws. Well, who? Law enforcement and military. There were temple guards that had to be on guard during the Sabbath. And then there were people involved in the services on the Sabbath, like the teachers, the readers, the musicians, the music directors, and the gatekeepers. So on a Sunday morning at any given church, you're going to find people who are not worshiping directly because they're in service roles. They're on the AV team, they're ushers, there's a security team, um, and so on. And so you have people that kind of have to work the service. But as someone who works the service, my concern is regular folk on a regular day with no service responsibilities that perhaps are not taking the vocal portion of the worship very seriously. And you might say, well, how can you know? How can you judge? I don't know. And so that's going to be between you and the Lord. Remember, friends, that the music portion of the service is not a warm-up. 
It's not a pregame event. It's a time that we come in before the Lord, a holy convocation where we lift up our voices as an act of worship. Music is not a means to an end, but it's an end in of itself. And so my challenge for you today, and again, I don't, I'm not like watching and judging people. I just, this is a challenge for all of us. One is show up early and be here. Be prepared. Be, get your heart ready to say, you know what? This is the Lord's time. The Lord has blessed me. I have this. He's done this. The Lord has been good to me. I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. All of this greatness. Walk in and say, this is my time to offer up my voice as an act of worship. And so come in early and maybe read a Bible. Get your heart prepared. Pray. Get, get some coffee. But, but do that before the service. And I know there's a conversation you need to have with your friend here. Like, oh, I sent you this attachment. Did you have like all that stuff, right? Deal with that after the service. This is the Lord's time. Turn the ringer off on your phone. And when the service begins, without distraction, lift up your voice in spirit and in truth as an act of worship before the Lord who saved you. Offer Him your best. Now, I know that there are people here who are going to say, I don't know how to sing, and my voice is so bad that my, at my last church, when I sang, it caused a church split. <laughs> That's how bad my voice is. And I get it. So if that's you, you can still show up, get your heart prepared, stand before the Lord, and maybe you just say the words out loud. I don't know. But this is the Lord's time, and we want to offer up our voices to Him as an act of worship. Once again, the music is not a warm-up to the sermon. It is an offering. The Lord accepted Abel's offering because he did it correctly, and he rejected Cain's offering because he did it incorrectly. So he cares about the mechanics and the precision with which we present our offerings to him. Here's the next one. And if you thought the last one was bad, this one is even going to be more popular. And this is to bring our offerings of money. Sometimes people will say, they'll use kind of religious words to soften it. It's money. <laughs> now, I want you to notice what Cain got right here in this story. Cain did in fact recognize that there is a God and that he is Lord and that I should bring something to him. Cain worked the ground with his toil, with his sweat. He cultivated seeds. He cultivated sprouts. He cultivated vines. He cultivated plants. And after a long investment, the ground produced fruit. And this fruit was edible, and it could be used in trade or commerce. This fruit was valuable in our vernacular. This fruit was money. And Cain knew enough to bring this fruit to the Lord and offer it to him. And so he got that right. Now, if you're new here, I don't use this stage to ask for money. I just don't worry about that. The Lord has blessed us financially, and your giving is between you and God. You might say, well, why, what does God want us to give? Well, he does it for two reasons. The first one is that it's practical. In the Old Testament, there was a temple system. You had priests, you had Levites, you had gatekeepers, you had musicians. There was a system in place, and all of those people who served needed to make a living so that they could provide for themselves and their families. Now, remember in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was conducting reforms in the temple, and he found some things were going wrong, and we read about it in Nehemiah 13. This is his testimony, first person. I also found that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. In our vernacular, he's saying people weren't giving, so the clergy had to return to the secular marketplace in order to provide for their families. And the Lord had previously commanded his people, take care that you do not neglect the Levite as long as you live in your land. And so churches, my friends, must pay for electricity, propane, water, taxes, government compliance, building and grounds, equipment, services, subscriptions, staff, the very chair that you are sitting on here, someone had to buy. And it was a collection of all of us giving. Now, I understand that there are a few high-profile so-called pastors who amass a large sum of money. And I understand that churches have made foolish financial decisions, and you could turn on the news and see all these horrible stories, but the churches, the thousands and thousands and thousands of churches 
that simply do their ministry, collect their offerings, support their church, these are the ones that you never hear about, and this is what's happening in most of our churches. Now, I can't go through all the verses, but if I were to summarize, what does the New Testament teach about bringing our financial offerings? Now, again, this is just my summary of the New Testament because we can't go through all of the verses. Here it is. A Christian should give a decided but sacrificial proportion with cheer in order to have a fully resourced church and a thriving community. And this is what we ought to be offering. But once again, that's between you and the Lord. Now, the second reason we give is because it changes us. The best way to determine what is valuable to someone is to look at their financial statements. And when we commit to giving God our first fruits, it forces us to budget. It forces us to plan. It makes us better managers of our money. But it also has a promise attached to it that we find from Malachi chapter 3, which the Lord says, I want you to test me in this. Bring the tithes into the storehouse and see how I will bless you. Now, I, I think this, that verse would speak for itself, but the, the end of the day, it's just you have to decide who you're going to trust. And so we bring our offerings to the Lord and we bring them according to his standard. So ultimately, Abel's offering was accepted by the Lord because of something deeper than the precision. The precision was important, but there was something else. And we will read about it, and we should therefore bring our offerings by faith. I want to share with you perhaps one of the most disturbing passages in the Bible. This passage shows us that the Lord will not be manipulated by our offerings. And should we present to Him our worship, our offerings, and our gifts? Yes, we should. But He will not be controlled or manipulated by a corrupt heart. Here's how Amos would describe an offering that was likely precise, but not done with an honest heart. This is from Amos chapter 5. Check this out. I hate... I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And even the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen. Can you imagine that, us gathering together on a Sunday morning and the Lord saying, I hate your Lord's Supper. I can't stand your potlucks. I don't care that you're raising your hand. I, I, I'm not accepting your music. I'm, you, I don't care how big of a check you wrote. I'm not accepting any of it. Why? Because in this story, these offerings, though they were precise, they were done by a group of immoral manipulators who only gave because they thought they could exploit God for their own ends. This is a type of person who will mistreat the person behind the counter, belittle the person in the drive through cut off the person in traffic, rip off people in the marketplace, tear into people on social media, and refuse to help anyone in need, and then come to church on Sunday and raise their hand and praise the Lord and give their offerings exactly the way the Lord has commanded them to do. And the Lord says, I will not have any of that. Our offerings are only as good as the motives behind them. Now, curiously enough, some 4,000 years after Abel made this offering, the writer of Hebrews would comment on it. And this is how the writer of Hebrews described Abel's offering. He says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, and God commending him by accepting his gifts. You see, for Abel, this wasn't a rote, mechanical task that he was forced into doing to appease some angry deity. No, Abel knew God, he loved God, he wanted to serve God, and he had faith in God. And so from that place, Abel offered his sacrifice that, yes, it was precise according to God's standard, but it was also by faith in that his motives were pure. And that's why we go back to the beginning where I say we should offer our sacrifices with both faith and precision. We must do them exactly how the Lord commands, and we must do them from a heart that wants to serve and to love him. 
Now, my fear in presenting this message to you today is that I've given people in this room kind of an emotional beating, and I've made God seem like some sort of jaded, angry, mad person who's up there with a lightning bolt just waiting for us to step out of line so that he could blast us. And that's just not the case. Many of you here have had relatives, dads, moms, that you loved so much and they loved you so much, and yet still they had boundaries. They said, son, I love you, my daughter, I love you, but here are boundaries and you, you cannot cross them. And you will live the good life. You will be blessed. You will have my, my blessing. You will have my favor. I will accept what you've done if you will just keep it within these boundaries. And so to live the good life, to live the good life and to walk with God, to be men and women of faith, is to look and see what does God want us to do? How can we worship Him? How can we present our offerings to Him? How can we remember His sacrifice and do it with precision, but also with faith? And when we do this, the Lord smiles upon us. This is how we live the good life. We call upon Jesus as Lord, and then we offer up um, our voices, um, our remembrances, our, our, our first fruits, and our very lives to Him.